From 12 News, this is Newsmakers. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside my colleague Ted Nisi. Earlier this month, voters in District 15 made a change that was felt throughout the state, handing Speaker Nicholas Mattiello a loss to Republican challenger Barbara Ann Fenton Fung. Days later, a majority of the House Democrats threw their support behind State Representative Joe Shikarchi as their next Speaker of the House and State Rep Christopher Blazajewski as the new Majority Leader. They join us in studio now. And I want to point out to all of our viewers that we are spread out very far apart to comply with social distan distancing. Gentlemen, congratulations to you both and, and welcome you. to 12 News. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be on the show. I have to tell you, Ted and I both uh, struggled with uh, what to call you before this show <laughs> uh, because it's, you know, is, is it speaker-elect, you right. know, leader-elect, but we're going to stick with your current titles if you're, if you're okay with that. Fine. Yeah. Okay, great. We assume you won't march off in protest. <laughs> Not time. at all. Yeah. But technically speaking, he is the leader of, that, the, of the House right now. Is right. he actually? Absolutely. The caucus met and they elected Chris Blazajewski. But So much. wait, so we have two leaders? Yeah. No, just him. He's the leader. I'm just a, a, a rep Joe Shikashi. <laughs> well, this is even more uncomfortable than so. <laughs> but wait, so who, I actually wondered this, who will sit in the leader seat if you come back before you have become the speaker? Uh, where we sit doesn't matter the title. We'll, oh, we'll, come uh, on and, now. No, it really, really? does. <laughs> not, not, to, not to Chris and I, it doesn't matter. We want to get the job done for everybody, for the House and for Rhode Island. So the title and the, the seat and the parking spot are honestly all irrelevant <laughs> to us. They really are. <laughs> We've been doing this too long to buy that, but that's okay. That's it, right. You'll be sitting six feet apart no matter what happens. Uh, and I do actually, I want to get to that. That's really my first question. Uh, and Leader Shikarchi, when, when will the House take up the budget? Uh, th this year's budget, I don't know yet. Uh, I'm supposed to meet tomorrow with the Senate President. I had a very good meeting with the Governor. Uh, I think we have to come back, but I'm not quite sure. I never sat on the House Finance Committee, so I'm going to get caught up on this stuff. I've had briefings, uh, two briefings with our own internal House fiscal staff. Uh, Chris and I are having another briefing this afternoon after the taping of the show. So uh, it looks like we may have to come back uh, to preserve some of the COVID spending and to do a few uh, housekeeping matters. I'm not quite sure, but my, we'll find out in the very near future. B before January, though? Uh, that would be the mo strong likelihood would be before January, absolutely, before Christmas, absolutely. And, and how do you anticipate meeting? Is it going to be, are you open to virtual participation, or are you going to go to the convention center like the Senate is going to do? So we haven't decided that yet. Every single day we look at the news like you guys do uh, regarding the COVID restrictions and regulations. Unfortunately, we're in a surge right now during this pandemic. So we want to make sure it's safe for every member, but we want to get the people's business done. So those options, as you said, uh, Tim, are absolutely on the table, whether it's the convention center, the veterans. Uh, we even talked about going outside under a tent if we had to, but we need to get the people's business done and we need to conduct it safely. So, and the remote option is, is with studying that as well. We have a, a group of our representatives actually doing some deep dive and some research for that. Do, do you think you're gonna need a, an advisory opinion from the Supreme Court? Uh, you know, for the constitutional question as to whether you can uh, convene remotely? Uh, I don't believe we need, uh, uh, my interpretation so far is we may need an advisory opinion to do remote voting, but I'm not sure if we convene in the city of Providence, it would be okay. I don't think we need to go to the Supreme Court for that. That's preliminary. I, I have uh, legal counsel looking into that matter, but that's certainly uh, an issue that's been brought up and we're studying it. Okay. One other question on the timing, because it matters to a lot of people beyond the reps uh, and centers. If you came back for the budget, is it more likely you come back in November this month or more likely in December? Because of the holiday and the current surge we're in today, it's likely to be early December if we come back. It will probably not be Thanksgiving week. I think it'll be hard to get a quorum Thanksgiving week. People yeah. want to be with their families, and people honestly are afraid right now. Uh, COVID is surging in Rhode Island, it's surging all over the country, but it's surging right here. So we're all, you know, want to social distance and be safe, but we're going to get the people's business done as well. Rep. Blazewski, question for you. Um, you know, there were one of the alternative potential teams had been Rep. Moore and Rep. Craven, and they put out a statement uh, endorsing the two of you, and they said that you two had, quote, committed to a substantial restructuring of House rules and culture. But then I heard Rep. Chikarchi, uh tell reporters he made, you guys had made no commitments, um, and they said committed. So uh, I'd imagine there were some conversations. Can you give any sense of what kinds of changes and how the House is run you guys have at least contemplated that brought Rep. Moore and Rep. Craven, among others, on board? 
Sure, so um, we're gonna be a member-driven chamber and we're gonna collect ideas from other members, including Representative Amore, Representative Craven, Others have submitted potential rule changes, so we're going to take a look at all of that. You know, I think it, we heard loud and clear from the caucus that the way things are running is, is it has to change. We have to change the way we're running what our chamber. What was the biggest complaint you heard as you, as you tried to garner votes? Well, a lot of it was just logistics about how the chamber works, about how the bills go through committee, about um, the committee process. We heard a lot about that. We also heard about looking into remote voting. Um, I think people looking into the next year, um, and, and seeing that we have to get the business of the state done to improve the, the status of our, our constituents and um, to deal with all the issues pressing against our state, that we have to look at a way to deal with remote voting in the new year. And you we know, heard that loud and clear. You know, and Leader, look, the House has gotten a lot of grief for not convening during this time. I know you're the incoming speaker, but you were majority leader. Um, why didn't you push to convene in some sort of way, or did you, and that was a non-starter for Speaker Mattiello? Uh, my conversations with Speaker Mattiello remain private between us, but uh, we, we, we agree on a lot of stuff, and sometimes we don't agree on stuff, but I don't air those things publicly. But I will say this, we did come back in June, and we did come back in July. Um, I think also you, when you say the House to come back, the House can't come back alone to do, no, we need the Senate to come back with us. And we, we need the governor to supply a revised budget. Right, but you don't, so, so you don't have there, sway over the I, Senate. I know, That's it, why I'm asking. Yeah, it there are a couple of reasons. That, and actually, in hindsight, it may have been good. We would have acted on a budget without the latest uh, financial um, revenue estimates. That is critical. Those estimates have significantly improved since September. The, the new revenue estimates, the revenue conference between the House, the Senate, the Governor's Office just last week came in and made the proposed deficit much easier to uh, pass and, and fill the hold, so to speak. So I think it was actually good from a fiscal standpoint that we actually did wait till we had accurate numbers. And we were also waiting, honestly, for Washington to act. We were waiting to see what happens. We kept hearing, as I'm sure you wonderful guys in the media heard, Washington's going to pass one, Mitch McConnell's going to pass one, Nancy Pelosi's going to pass one, Trump's going to on board with this one, that one. None of that materialized. Everybody was waiting. And at that time, and I think even currently now, none of the Rhode Island, uh, none of the, excuse me, none of the New England states have passed a budget, not just Rhode Island. None of us have passed budgets in New England. I'll have to fact check, check that out for sure the northern you, New I'm, England states. But okay. I'm sure you will. Let mm -hmm. me ask you about uh, personnel. That's one of the biggest decisions a speaker makes. And uh, first of all, Leo Skenyon, will you keep him as chief of staff? I will sit down with Leo and I'll make that decision in January. I will not going to announce or, or prejudge any announcements until after January 5th. I am not the Speaker of the House until then, until I get elected by the entire membership, and then we'll review all those personnel decisions. It's uh, in So you're open to keeping Leo? I'm open to keeping and getting rid of and getting all of the above. I, all these decisions will be made after January 5th. But in every change of administration, in every transition from one administration to there are always changes. What those changes are, what they're going to look like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. What about uh, George Zania? Uh, is he someone you know well? Would you consider him for chief of staff? George Zania is a very talented individual. I got asked about him by several members of the media. It's a good question, Ted, and I get a lot of uh, inquiries. I find George to be very talented. He was chief of staff to uh, U.S. Senator, uh, excuse me, U.S. Representative Kennedy. He was chief of staff to Governor. Uh, Chafee. Chafee and Secretary of State Langevin. So he has a wealth of information and knowledge. Uh, George is someone I would certainly consider for a position if he was interested in coming. I don't know if he's interested in coming to the House. Um, I'm curious, Chris, what will you advise, Rep, I should say? Uh, you can see how informal it gets in the House sometimes no up there worries. with the reporters. Uh, what is your advice on JCLS? Uh, this is the committee for folks at home that you know, runs the budget um, for the House and the Senate. It's right now the subject of a lawsuit. It's part of what led to the grand jury and the convention center that we reported on earlier this year. You know, are you going to advise uh, when he is Speaker, Speaker Shikarchi, to, to have them meet? They haven't met in years. Well, I think Speaker Shikarchi has already uh, been clear about that, that he, he understands that JCLS needs to be reformed, that they need to meet on a potentially regular basis. I believe um, Speaker Chikarchi mentioned quarterly. Uh, there is an ongoing lawsuit, so that obviously complicates things in the, in the short term. But over the long term, uh, clearly JCLS is something that we're going to have to take a look at and really do a deep dive after January 5th, after the vote, when um, um, 
Joe is elected speaker. Quarterly I, is that is that likely? Yeah, yes. Yeah. And keep keep in mind, you know, most of JCLS has to deal with personnel. Mm -hmm. So while we may be meeting, I don't know how much of the personnel part of that will be public. But I I want JCLS to me. I, I want the, the body of JCLS to be the body making the major decisions. Just a follow up on that, leader. Uh, the the House controls JCLS. Would you support giving the Senate parity no. on the committee? No? no. Okay, that was clear. Rep mm -hmm. Blazajewski. I told you. Uh, yes, he did. Before <laughs> well, the show, he predicted and, that answer. And there's, there's a reason. Well, yeah, well, you know what? Why? There's a reason for that because it's a balance of power that's been decided a long time ago. Uh, the Senate has, you know, exclusive control over the judges and the House negotiated the JCLS years ago. I see no reason to change it. I think if you meet and you communicate, there will be uh, no need for parity. Um, Rep. Blazajewski, Speaker Mattiello liked to refer to himself as a firewall, uh, particularly from progressive policies. You are looked at as a leader uh, uh, in the you know, progressive caucus, if you will, of, of the Democratic caucus. You're now in a leadership position. Can people expect a shift to the left in the House? Well, I think if you take a look at the work product, I, I think many pieces of progressive legislation have passed over the last couple of years. I'll point to the Reproductive Privacy Act, which was um, passed in the House that protected the, uh, the rights guaranteed by Roe versus Wade um, to ensure that no matter what happens with the Supreme Court in Washington, those rights are protected here in Rhode Island. We passed that under Speaker Mattiello. Um, we passed legislation to extend the statute of limitations for uh, uh, childhood sexual abuse. That was a major piece of legislation pushed by Representative McEntee. We passed that. We passed legislation banning uh, uh, undetectable firearms, otherwise known as ghost guns and 3D printed guns. We passed that. We passed the Fair Chance Licensing Act. Pay which time is, off. Uh, pay time off. There's been a lot of pieces of legislation. We've made a lot of headway. And so I expect to, to be able to continue to look at legislation that comes in and continue to make headway for the, for the good of the state of Rhode Island. Well, you brought up gun residents. control. So a, qu a quick question to you both. The uh, majority of House and Senate members, uh, as you recall, co-sponsored a bill last session banning high-capacity magazines in Rhode Island. Would you support or oppose that bill, Leader Shakar Chief? I, I, am, I am not one of the people who co-sponsored that legislation, right. so I'm not familiar with the exact details of it. But uh, It so would ban magazines that hold more than 10 rounds. They are currently banned in Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New York. So what we'll do is we'll have hearings on that, and I want to hear from all sides How of it. How do you feel, though? How I'm you feel? open to it either way. I mean, uh, I'm open to it. If it makes sense, I'm for good uh, common uh, gun safety. If it makes sense and the bill ac accomplishes what it's intended to do, I have no problem moving any piece of legislation. If it doesn't do that, if it's just a feel-good piece of legislation, then it doesn't make sense. So I want to hear input from everybody on that, and then we, the House collectively will make a decision. Rep, real quick, how would you vote? Well, I'm a co-sponsor of legislation yeah. in the past, uh, but what I'd say is that we, as, as I said earlier, we're going to be a member-driven uh, committee and uh, building and we have a committee process and a judiciary chair, Rep Craven is the current judiciary chair. The, the, we want the community process to be very substantive, and so I don't think that we can prejudge on anything, but I, I, it was a co-sponsor of legislation. Previously. All right, we're going to take a break here on Newsmakers. When we come back, a lot more to get to. Is 2021 the year for legalized recreational marijuana in Rhode Island? We're going to ask that question. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside 12 News Politics Editor Ted Nisi. Our guests this week are incoming House Speaker Joe Shikarchi and incoming Majority Leader Chris Blazajewski. Ted. Uh, Rep Shikarchi, I want to ask you a big picture question. Um, we've been hitting you with a lot of specifics. When you look ahead to the 2020s in this new decade we're in, what do you think is the number one policy challenge Rhode Island is going to face? continuing to prove our business climate so that it benefits everybody from top to bottom. We need to create good, high-paying private sector jobs uh, that will attract good, talented people to Rhode Island. They'll pay taxes. That'll fund social services. We have to make the economy of Rhode Island work for everyone. Chris, uh, I keep saying Chris, I've uh, known you too long. Uh, the, um, you'll want to agree with the speaker on the party since you're the leader and that's your job, but I'll ask you, What's another, then, major policy challenge you see coming down the pike for around the next decade? I think health care. I mean, I think you hear that from constituents. I think you, you see it in, in terms of the, the hospitals talking about merging. I mean, I think health care is always on the top of mind of families, of uh, seniors. 
Um, everyone really wants to know that when, they're, when they have something come up that they have the health care that they need and they have the coverage for it. So I think health care is going to continue to be a major issue in this country for years to come. One other question, and I'll get back to Tim. You know, as I, uh, one thing that hasn't changed as we look at this tableau is we have two men in charge of the House once again, and there is, are more and more calls to bring more women into House leadership. There's still not been a woman House Speaker. There's been a woman Senate President, and, and Dominic Ruggiero has made that a big part of it. How, you know, are you going, will women get higher positions Positions, Rep. Shikarchi, in your leadership team than they than they currently have in the current leadership team. I always have valued women, and they absolutely will always have, and I always will. Uh, Would you Ted. consider making a change? Could go as high as whip? It's possible. We're going to sit down and talk to all of them. Whip, deputy whip, chairman. There's a lot of leadership positions. We're going to be. Chris and I are talking about restructuring the committees and the process in the house. So all of that. We have a lot of bright, talented people, and half of them are women, and half of them they, they deserve half the leadership positions. Uh, before I get to the marijuana question that I teased in the first half, leader, I just I'm curious. Speaker Mattiello has uh, taken to blaming the media, uh, and he says he was treated unfairly. Do you share his views on that? I would, those are his views, and you'll have to ask him for it. I haven't followed that race that quickly, uh, closely. You believe it or not? I know simply Please. Say, well, That's no, very no, hard. No, to I'll, I'll be honest with you. My focus was on the members' races. I was in Woonsocket. I was with in Johnston. I was with all over the state helping members. And, and that's where my focus was because the speaker was so focused. And honestly, I believed that election night the speaker was going to win. I wasn't prepared. We weren't, like, huddled up in a war room waiting to do I was at cellos having a Caesar salad that's what, what, what it, and I expected if there was going to be a problem it would be a close race but I, my uh, energy was in Lincoln with Marianne Shawcross in, in Johnston with Eddie Cardillo in Winsocket with Steve Lima those were all new, incoming new people they needed to be um, paid attention to they needed to be helped and supported not to mention in Warwick I was worried about some of the Warwick races for my colleagues all over the state, up and down the East Bay and West Bay, I was focused on the caucus, and that's the truth. Whether you want to believe it or not, that really was the truth. So uh, I, 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 I know we had a debate here with you. Yeah. I only saw bits and pieces of the debate, honestly, because I, I was just busy with other reps. I had, I had like 70-some-odd other races I was worried about. Mm -hmm. All right, we're not hurt too much. Rep. Blazajewski, <laughs> uh, is 2021 the year of legalized recreational marijuana in Rhode Island? Well, it's certainly uh, something we'll take a look at. I believe I was one of a handful of people that co-sponsored it many years ago with uh, Rep Slater and Rep Agello, and certainly the issue has come a long way in that time. I remember many years ago we would have trouble finding people co-sponsoring it. Now we have um, the Senate leader and the, the Senate president seemingly fully endorsing it. So it's an issue that's really come a long way. I think we have much more experience around the, with other states to draw upon. Uh, but it's something, you know, we're going to take a look at, especially with all of the, the many budgetary issues that we're facing. I, I know, Leader, you won't, you won't say how you're going to vote on this or whatever, but are you open to it? Absolutely, yes. And I will point out that five states, and you can fact check me, Ted, <laughs> but in five states in the past election passed recreation uh, marijuana in the country. So we're heading in that direction as a country. So yes, I'm open to it. I want to listen to all sides, what they have to say. I don't have any hard and fast position on uh, legalization of marijuana. And, and then even if we decided to legalize it, how do we legalize it? And who gets to sell it? Who gets to manufacture it? Who gets to to distribute Do you all. like the governor's idea of sort of modeling the New Hampshire liquor store uh, uh, distribution method? I, I, I looked at that very briefly a year ago when the budget came in, but when we hit COVID, so it really kind of fell by the wayside. I know that some people think it should be left to the current cultivators and the current dispensaries. The governor feels maybe it should be like, uh, like you said, state run, state run uh, like they do in New Hampshire with the liquor like, uh, stores. I think maybe we can look at a private model. Do, do, do every mom and pop, who, people who sell cigarettes, should they have the right to sell marijuana? marijuana as well too. I don't know the answers to any of those questions, but I know that we need to have hearings on it, we need to get input, so I'm open to that. Uh, one quick follow-up on that. Your job as a leader has been in part to count heads and see That's how many votes are. Do you think there is currently majority support in the House to legalize recreational marijuana? I think it's very close. I don't, I don't know. I, I haven't, it, it has really been, I know a lot of people on the outside talk about it, it has not been a, a really hot issue inside the House caucus. So we, I know that, uh, as Lita Blasajewski said, there are certain representatives who were very much in favor of it. I know there are certain against it, but I, it's not a hot issue for the majority of people. But I think that it, it could go either way. It really depends on how the bill is crafted who gets to make the decisions of who sells and how it's manufactured. Is it going to be a state-run system or a private-run system? All those things go into effect.
I want to ask you about your relationship with Governor Raimondo. You mentioned you, you uh, met with her earlier this week. You were her campaign manager in 2010. You won that race, obviously, when she ran for general treasurer. You, and you know how fraught her relationship has been at times with Speaker Mattiello over the years. There might be folks who worry that now, as you switch from a speaker who clashed a lot with Governor Raimondo to a speaker who has a pre-existing relationship, whether you won't you know, stand up for the House or she'll have an easier time getting her way. What do you say to those concerns? I say it, that's that people who have those concerns don't know me and they don't know the governor. We, I like her and I respect her, but we disagree. And I'm not afraid I, I, to be an island. I'm not afraid for the House to be alone. My constitutional obligations and my you know, preference is always to stand up for the House and what I think is right for my constituents in District 23 and for the state as a whole. And I have no problem saying no to the governor or no to the Senate president on any issue. Let me ask you also about uh, your private law practice. Our old friend Dan McGowan had a good Boston Globe story earlier this week. You're, you've been a very successful lawyer. Um, you are a successful lawyer. You've done extensive legal work for clients. You're saying you'll scale that back as speaker, but obviously you won't stop entirely because you need to earn a living. It's, it's, I know it's a part-time job as speaker. W why not publish an annual list of your clients so that there's no question about any conflicts since that's not on the ethics form. I don't know of any lawyer who, who's ever held elective office who does that in a part-time position. I have to respect the professional conduct and code of attorney-client privilege. I will scale back my practice dramatically. It's already happened. Some of my clients have already been calling me and saying, you know, who do I go to? Where do I go? What's going to happen? Uh, I just feel it's it's clients' privacy, that who they hired me, whatever, but I will not be doing any work at all. I have not done any work in the state. I mean, I just want you to know that all the, the, the Dan McGowan story was uh, clients that I focused in the public arena for municipal work. But think about it, but you, yeah. and you know, you're, you're not naive. You walk, you're the, the Speaker of the House right. walks into the exit or bo zoning board or something. Th that's going to have a different effect than a lawyer they've never heard of. I mean, are you, you know, is there a way a Speaker can do uh, work in public bodies that does not raise questions about whether he's getting favorable treatment because he's so powerful? There are always going to be people who raise uh, questions and allegations. I feel very comfortable. I talk to Jason Graham. If I feel I'm even close to a gray area, I call him. I try to get guidance from him. He's with the Ethics Commission, he, we should point he, out. He's the executive director of the, of the Ethics Commission. And before that, he was a legal counsel for the Ethics Commission. And I try to live my practice. Uh, you know, I, I'll say this proudly. I have never had a disciplinary problem in over 20 years of practicing law. Never mind a disciplinary Proper disciplinary inquiry at all. So I'm very careful for that. I'm going to be extra uh, vigilant and, and also careful. I want to avoid it, the appearance of it, let alone an actual conflict. I've practiced law for a lot of years and I've been successful. And I think some people get upset that I win a case because they feel like, I, oh, you must be politically connected. But I've been practicing law well, you know, I've only been elected for eight years. I've been practicing law for over 20 some odd years. And I've, I'm successful because I work hard at it. And, but part of that reason is I don't take cases I don't think I can win either. So that's a, a little bit of a, a skewing of the curve. But some people, when they lose a case, they get very mad. It's, it's the nature we're in. If, if, I win, you lose, you're mad at me. It can't be on the merits, so we have to attack Shikachi for whatever the reason is. I have broad shoulders, I can handle that criticism, and I'm cognizant of that, uh, and I'm sure, as John Howell pointed out yesterday, and I'm sure you wonderful people in the media, Tim and Tam, if you think uh, I'm doing something wrong, you're going to call me out on it. So I'm cognizant that I have a bullseye on my back, and I'm cognizant there are a lot of eyes on Joe, what Joe Shikachi does. And I think the media is a very good um, arbitrator of what's right and what's wrong. All right. We'll remind we, him of that yes, when, uh, in two years. <laughs> like a we'll play that soundbite for you. Um, two minutes left, and Rep. Blazajewski, quickly, I want you to wear your political analyst hat. Um, we're hearing from Democrats nationally that the sharp left turn a chunk of the party did uh, caused real harm in the presidential election as well as Congress, the House law seats, it looks like the GOP will retain the Senate. Did policies like defund the police and Medicare for all hurt Democrats in the end? And as a progressive, are you reflecting on this post-election? No, I don't, I don't believe any of that. I, th I think that what we saw was Democrats coming together in recognizing that there was a threat to our nation and the threat was the president of the United States, Donald Trump, and they kicked him out of office. And they did that by appealing to moderates, by appealing to progressives, by using the progressive energy to help mobilize people to get active. And I think it was the party really coming together. And I, and I think it's something that we have to work on in our chamber, really uh, bringing the Democrats together and working together for the betterment of, of our state. Do you, uh, uh, Rep. Shikarchi, plan to continue to control the Rhode Island Democratic Party as speakers have in recent decades? 
I think the party needs to be restructured and modernized, and I'm willing to do that with the governor and the Senate president and all Democrats, local city and town chairs, who many of them are friends of mine who've already reached out to me and talked to me. But the, the party needs to modernize. They've done a very good job. This is not a criticism of the staff that works what there. What is that? We're running out of time. What is that modernize? What, what about it? We need to do modeling. We need to up, up, upgrade our, our computer capabilities. We need to uh, canvassing. Uh, we, the party needs to, to be brought to the 2021 election cycle right away and quickly. Leader Shikarchi, 20 seconds left. Are, are you open to the line item veto? I ha it's not, uh, like I said before, it's not a hot issue with my caucus, but if someone wants to I wonder bring that why. Up, well, uh, if somebody wants to bring that up in conjunction with, you know, four-year terms, I'm, I'm willing to listen to it. I'm willing to look at it. Or term limits. I mean, those things are popular with the media, but they don't seem to resonate All in the right, chamber. All right, got to go. Thank you for watching Newsmakers, everyone. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.